how the smallest particles of light, when combined, can vanish the biggest of the storms. This is a tale about you from all over the region doing science, doing synthetic biology, and gathering together to vanish the big problems of mankind. This is what we are doing here, building a fiery snake flying in the sky. Okay, Anderson? I think so. Okay, so to start the day, I'd like to greet everyone that traveled from far away to join us today. So I'd like to say, I may miss some, I will try my best. I'd like to say hello, Salvador. Hello, Manaus. Hello, Curitiba. Hello, Campinas. Hello, Araraquara. Hello, Lo Lorena. Hello, Recife. Hello, what am I missing? São Carlos. <laughs> Hello, Rio. Um, oh, yes. Hello, Ecuador. Yeah, they, they beat you guys. So the question that you may be asking is why we are not in Rio by a sign beach? I'm asking the same question. But actually, there are some very good reasons to be here in São Carlos today. São Carlos has one PhD per 100 inhabitants. This is the highest rate in Brazil. São Carlos is home to one startup to every, I need, I need to check. 1,332 inhabitants. This is a rate around the same of Israel. São Carlos is home to the Federal University of São Carlos that is ranked the 15th, numbers are hard in English, decima quinta, 15th best university in Latin America. It's home to a uh, USP campus, ranked the second best in Latin America. It's home to two Embrapa institutes. Embrapa is the Agriculture Research Institute of Brazil. There are only four cities in the country that have more than one Embrapa Institute. So here you are in the capital of innovation in Brazil. This is the reason that we, this will be your home for the next three days. The next question that you may be asking is, why Onovala? Why not one of those universities or research institutes? And to answer this question, I would like to welcome my friend, friend, my friend, mi amigo, Anderson Creativo. Hi, everyone. Good morning for you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, you have no idea how happy am I now. Uh, I, I would like to, I'd like to tell you uh, the story of this place. Uh, four years ago, this factory was completely abandoned. Uh, it was completely destroyed. Uh, there was no roof here. Uh, it was a completely destroyed place. Uh, here, it was uh, an old factory, uh, and it was uh, during four decades completely ab abandoned uh, in downtown city, so we are in the middle of the city. And uh, I, I made my career in Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm from Santos, but I, I moved to Sao Paulo to study. I lived there for 20 years, and during these 20 years in Sao Paulo, uh, I've made a lot of big events of technology, startups, and this kind of stuff. And after 15 years doing it, I stopped with my, my, my partner, and we started to think, what else could we do? Because here in Brazil, we have so many talents, and of course, in, in Latin America, we have so many talented people, but our country do not help to develop these people. So why not? What, what, what's missing in, in, in this story? So uh, we started to think that when we organize events and we put so many people together and we, we exchange experiences and we meet each other in person, so a lot of incredible things happen after that. But what if we could create a space to cultivate this relationship uh, during all the year, not only once a, a year? 
And it was like a, an insight. Uh, what if we create an innovation center in Brazil, but a different kind of innovation center? It's not a university-based uh, innovation center, and, uh, and it's not uh, funded by the government. So why don't we create a startup that is an innovation center? So it was a, a crazy idea at that time, 2017, Brazil was living a big crisis in, in terms of economics, as always. Uh, but uh, when we, we knocked at the doors of the companies and asked for a sponsorship or support to create uh, the, the innovation center, the answer was always no. So uh, me and my partner, we, we went to 400 uh, companies to ask for support, and we got two supports, two companies, Elo Cartões and Roche Pharma. Uh, it was the, the two companies that made the first, the seeds to make it happen. So with that money, we put uh, uh, to, to, to start uh, creating the, the first uh, warehouse there. So we started small, and after three years, we, we are now uh, 5,000 square meter uh, innovation center from nothing. So I didn't come here with money. Uh, I came here with two babies, uh, my, also my, my, my partner. So it was like a crazy idea. Uh, and without no exager exaggeration, but uh, I was 40 years old at that time. And sometimes before, weeks before uh, opening uh, the Novo Lab, I, 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 when, I started, when I came home at that time, I was cr literally crying. Uh, in despair, so I, I won't be able to make it happen. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe uh, it's not possible to do it in Brazil uh, weeks before the opening. And after that, somehow things worked well. Uh, we got the sponsorships. We started the project and we started to prove that when you put incredible people together, incredible things happen. So uh, Unovo Lab is uh, more than the story of a place, and it's more the story of a, 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 a community of innovators. And I'm, I'm telling you that, that story, not to talk about myself, but to talk about you, because you are uh, living, you are now in a journey of uh, synthetic biology that for me is one of the most incredible topics that uh, I've heard here uh, in Novo Lab, and I hear a lot of great stories and a lot of interesting people and topics like new space, uh, quantum computing, and this kind of stuff. But for me, in person, uh, I'm really uh, um, excited about uh, synthetic biology, all the possibilities. And you guys are the pioneers of that field of knowledge. So you are the, 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 the person, the people that will make it happen, that will transform lives, uh, millions or billions of lives during the, the coming decades. So that's why it's so exciting for me. So can you imagine uh, three or four years ago, I was trying to create a space for incredible people. And after four years, are you here from Ecuador, from Manaus, from Rio, from Recife, uh, so it, it's it's amazing for me, and so uh, what I ask you is to, uh, what I tell you, sorry, is to to, to dream big, because it, it's not so it's not a motivation talk, uh, it, it's about a real story in my case that it's it's happening, it's physical now, and sometimes when you are in Ecuador or here in Brazil, uh, we think that we aren't able to compete with Chinese with the, the Americans, with European companies, but uh, maybe we cannot compete with them, but we can collaborate with them, and we can become specialists in some fields and, and make great work. So that's uh, uh, I, I invite you to, during these three days of the event, to, to dream big, to not only make networking in terms of business networking, but to make relations, real relations, and, and believe in your potential, because sometimes it, it takes more time than we, we, we want, because uh, uh, I'm an entrepreneur since 1999, and now my, my, my dream is, is becoming physical, so after 20 years. So uh, I always say that here in Brazil, and I, I think also in Latin America, uh, 
you are you have a lot of money to do what you want or you need a lot of patience to do what you want because things don't happen so fast as we like that, that it happens so uh, that's my, my my message for you that for me it's a huge pleasure uh, I'm also an enthusiast and also an ambassador uh, an informal ambassador of uh, synthetic biology as I always talk to, to Guilherme uh, I talk with a lot of investors and um, in entrepreneurs and I always talk about synthetic biology and I uh, can affirm you that this field, this knowledge field and also the economic side of this field will happen during this decade. So it won't take more than five to ten years to, to become uh, big. And I'm talking about it because uh, when startups came to Brazil in 2010, 2011, uh, I organized in Brazil an event in 2012 called The Next Web. And it was uh, uh, the first international startup event in Brazil. And it was a small event like this. And we couldn't imagine in 2020 that after less than 10 years, we could have 34 unicorns here in Brazil, uh, SoftBank investing billions of uh, dollars in Brazil. Uh, so there's a, a, a major ecosystem now around startups. And I'm sure that it will happen uh, in the same way in, in synthetic biology. So uh, I ask you to, to be patient, uh, leave your passion because uh, startup movement and your movement is, is fooled by, by passion. So don't lose your passion during the, the journey because sometimes it's frustrating, sometimes it's, it will happen. Uh, but if you be persistent, uh, I'm sure that incredible things will happen. And I will be ha very happy to, to uh, have you again here in one or two or three or five years from now and hear your stories. And you tell me, Anderson, I, when I went to Brazil the first time or when I came to Sao Carlos or to o Novo Lab for the first time, I was just a dreamer. I was dreaming about doing something remarkable. And now, after five or ten years, I'm doing it. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, in fact, doing something remarkable. And uh, my last message is to uh, think in, in long term and also uh, be generous. Because normally, when you start something or when you are an entrepreneur, normally entrepreneurs are very greedy in terms of, ah, I want everything for me. I don't want to share. I don't want to generate value for anyone. Uh, so uh, I think the, the, the main things that I learned during this journey of 20 years as an entrepreneur is that when we create something that is for the collective, for society, uh, and it's much more than making money, uh, and, and in fact it's something about making an impact in society and also getting money or getting uh, any kind of reward, uh, incredible things happening happen. So it, it's, uh, Unovo Lab is about it. So it's something like a crazy idea to deliver value for society, to create a platform for talents. And after three years, it's becoming something that I, can, I couldn't imagine uh, an event like that happening here in my place. So it's a pleasure. So I, I think, I hope that you really enjoy this th these three days of event. And I, I will be here during the, the most of the time. So feel free, use this space. Uh, if you want to stay here after the sessions, stay here, enjoy, enjoy the, the, the event, okay? Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, Anderson, we will actually use this space a lot. We invited a samba band to have some music on Sunday, so we will have some food truck later today, so yeah, we will be around a lot. And to introduce our next session, I would like to talk a little bit about trends because you may have heard, or if you didn't yet, you will during the day, that the train comes very close to one of the The, the ray, railway? Yeah, the railways that you can see here and the train station that you can see here, it was actually an entrepreneurship initiative from 18, the 1880s. Uh, some people from the region decided that the pathway that the government wanted the trains to, to cross 
the way, way, way the government had planned it wasn't exactly what was good for them and the city. So they decided to create a company, the Hill Claro Railway, and they decided to bring the train themselves. And they built a railway starting in Campinas, crossing Rio Claro, coming to São Carlos, and ending in Araraquara. This is actually not a very good entrepreneurship story because the funding from this came from slavery. So I would like to propose to you a different kind of railway, a different kind of connection for this region. Something starting in Campinas, coming to Rio Claro, visiting São Carlos and ending in Araraquara, or, or maybe it can continue for their own, this is up to you. So in, the, in our next session, we will receive some professors developing state of art research in synthetic biology and related fields from each one of those cities, talking about the work they developed, but also showing to you what our region is doing in terms of biotech, in terms of science in general. There are many, many more researchers in the area. We represent just a few of the amazing professors we have around here, but this is uh, a way for you to taste what's happening in our region. So to get started, I would like to start by Campinas, and I would like to invite Professor Elizabeth, and we need to make the magic. Just a moment. guys thank you very much for being here today I had to <laughs> exercise uh, go against the laws of physics and be in two places at the same time so I was teaching in Campina while I was still here participating in this event so the my students are working in a practical assignments and I'll go back to them as soon as we finish talking so um, let me talk a bit, about, a bit about myself so I'm Brazilian went to Sweden to do my PhD, postdoc in Cambridge where I stayed for 11 years. But six years ago, I decided that it was time to come home. So I started my lab there at Unicampi, and I started a synthetic biology lab laboratory. And we used mainly geese as a platform for discovery of new medicines. So I'll give example of two main work, I'll give two practical examples of things that we've done based on two publications that we had this year. But I'm just, just to mention other things that we're doing there at the lab. So uh, the research in the lab is divided in six main lines of investigation. So I'm going to talk to you a bit, uh, to you a bit about using yeast as a way to discovering how new, how different medicines enter yeast cells or enter cells, enter target cells. Um, I won't mention one of the major lines of investigations where we engineer yeast cells to make them similar to different pro tropical parasites. So we can use it as a host to look for different uh, drugs to inhibit the growth of the parasites that cause malaria, leishmaniasis, and so forth. And we also engineer cells to uh, express the uh, enzymes from the human host so that we can look for drugs that inhibit the parasites but do not have side effects. Uh, I'm going to mention a bit about the work that we published this year, also using uh, pools of uh, engineer yeast strains to identify mechanisms of action of uh, antiplasmodia compounds. Uh, we are also using yeast high content strains to identify inhibitors of uh, aggregation of proteins, of human proteins that cause ALS or uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we are um, I came to Brazil with the funding of Papeste to start my own lab, the Young Investigator Grant, and I'm applying now for, I applied for a second round, and in the second round, we're going to continue with the current lines of investigation, and we are introducing a line we're including biosuspection. 
where we would uh, look for uh, organisms, uh, look for secondary metabolites, novel secondary metabolites. And in the last line of investigation here, we're working in collaboration with people uh, using uh, sugarcane uh, bagasse to um, as energy source. And uh, one of the big problems with the sugarcane bagasse is a very low pH. So we're in collaboration with Embrasa in, uh, in the Amazon in Roraima. And we have uh, samples of soils with a pH of about two, two and a half. So we are looking for enzymes within these organisms that might, might uh, be able to be transferred to yeast and make yeast resistant to these very low pHs so that they can use to produce second generation of ethanol or high value products. So this is the paper that I'm going to talk uh, mostly about. It was accepted for publication officially last week. And we use yeast then as a platform to discover how different human medicine and medicine or human uh, drugs go into to the target organism, or our target cell. So our pharmaceutical industry generally design drugs based on the principle that they would enter cells by passive diffusion by, by the membrane bilayer. But we have demonstrated, we and others have demonstrated that that is an exception rather than the rule. Uh, drugs generally enter cells using transporters used for importing amino acids, sugars, or other compounds into the cell. So if you understand the specificity of each of these plasma membrane transporters, we can potentially define the drug that will target the type of cell that we want to. So we have this line of investigation where we will look at the transporters in yeast, and where you also construct a new strain with a humanized plasma membrane. So we're engineering uh, the cell synthesis in yeast so that it will uh, produce cholesterol so we can use human transporters and, uh, in yeast as a, as a platform. So basically, we, uh, the, the principle of the matter is very simple. We have yeast cells. Yeast cells have uh, 135 non-essential plasma membrane transporters, so they can grow in the presence of a compound. If we have a toxic compound, they are toxic, then they manage to enter the cell. If you remove the transporter that would take the com that compound in, the cells would be resistant to that particular compound. The problem with yeast is that there is a lot of redundancy. So 100 million years ago, there was a, a whole genome duplication in yeast. So we have basically two copies of every transporter. So if we look for phenotype based on the absence of one transporter, we end up missing quite a lot. So what we did, we constructed libraries of double mutants of all these plasma membrane transporters. So that is based on a, a technology developed by the Bloom Lab in Canada, where you touch have a genetic script that allows And uh, you can select the source through very uh, clever selection tools that select uh, haploid cells, haploids that have recombined, that have both markers, and that are of a specific mating type. And this is very simple, and I could only have done, I can, I did construct these clusters of 130 complex strains with the help of my assistant, Catherine. So it's my daughter that came to the lab. She's so still in Cambridge, and she helped me to construct all these strains. So I like to mention from there quite, quite young. <laughs> so the principle of this, of this paper, the, the, this is a summary of the paper then, where we constructed this library, this double mutant library, where we have these pairs of deletions, 
we uh, determined concentration of compounds that were toxic to wildlife cells, and we could see that these strains that don't have, we have these pools of 14,000 strains that don't have the pairs of these plasma membrane transporters, and we could see conditions where we had strains without the transporters were resistant to the compound, that the toxic compound could no longer enter the cell. So we could identify individual colonies, or we could uh, prepare genomic DNA from this pool and identify just the specific mutants that were enriched in that population. And in this way, we could uh, detect then which transporters contributed most to the transport of that uh, chemical compound. So, for example, here, for this compound, 110 phenanthrolin, here we have wild type strain with control and with a, with a drug. Uh, here is a serial dilution of the cells, 10 times serial dilutions of the cells of this culture spotted into selected media. You can see that it's quite sensitive. If you have single mutant strains, they're very sensitive as well. Here, uh, mutants of uh, iron, chelated iron, combined with a uh, transporter of just normal iron, they're also sensitive. But if you combine different mutations of transporters in chelated iron, you start to see resistance. So we don't, we don't pick up this phenotype with single transporters. We need to delete at least two transporters so that we can limit the import of that particular drug. We also managed to identify, for example, pairs of transporters used to transport different acyl compounds into yeast strains. So I thought the class, a class of uh, fungicides mainly used to treat uh, fungal diseases, both in plants and, uh, and in human cells. So we managed to determine both import and export routes for these compounds. And we're doing a work now looking at the different fungicides used in agriculture. Because uh, we have very big problems in soy, for, for example, soy cultures, uh, where uh, we have resistant to one fungicide or another fungicide, but knowing how each of them enter the cell, you can suggest combining uh, fungicides that use different import routes, because if you have a mutation in one import route, you can have the other uh, as a backup. So it's very difficult to have naturally the mutation in both, both import routes. So this is one of, one of the lines. The other line is uh, using chemical genomic profiling to identify uh, targets or modes of action of different compounds. So we published this, this paper now in the beginning of the year where we used yeast to determine how this uh, natural compound biolacin that was used very much in item, item we actually used uh, constructs from the item there in Cambridge to produce biolatin in the lab. Um, so anyway, we uh, wanted to identify how this compound can, for example, kill the plasmodium parasite. So we used this. So first, we demonstrated that this uh, compound targets all different parasite stages, plasmodium parasite stages. And we decided to use chemical genetics or chemical genomics to identify how, how that happened. Um, we based this, this uh, technique was developed, or this methodology was developed mainly by Yuri Gyeve. So uh, if you're interested in chemical genomics profiling as a whole, I uh, suggest that you look into her, her research. So we based uh, assays on coupling sufficiency profiling. And what's that? Normally, you have two copies here of an essential gene A to a certain quantity of protein A. Uh, but if you only have one, co one copy of gene A, have half the quantity of protein, 
So with a certain amount of inhibitor, you manage to inhibit all that function. If you imagine that you have double copies, a homozygous strain, you will still have some protein here that will not be inhibited. So in competition, strains heterozygous will not have sufficient protein for the cell to grow. So we can grow them 6,000 heterozygous yeast strain in competition, um, prepare the genomic DNA and identify which strains are depleted on exfoliation. To make a very long story short, we identify then that this violation inhibits uh, different uh, chaperones. And we did loads of biochemical and biophysical studies with purified enzymes and saw that violation is indeed inhibiting or binding to both HAC70 and 90, inhibiting their function. And that leads to a hyperactivation of the proteasome. And uh, unbalance in the, pro uh, in the proteome of these parasites that leads to, to their death. And that's why it's conserved in all the, the cycle, in all the stages of life of this parasite. So we're continuing a bit that work. As I said, we're entering on these different lines of investigation. And hopefully, next year we will also have, finally, to host the Unicampi Gen team. And this is who pays the bills, mainly FAPESI, uh, BBSRC, and uh, Wittenstock Throw, that's from Sweden, and BBSRC from England, pays for, for part of the research based on collaborations that we have with the University of Cambridge, Liverpool, and Gothenburg in Sweden. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And for the next step. <laughs> and for the next step of our train, I'd like to invite Professor Jefferson to talk um, from Rio Claro, to talk in our the Rio Claro Railway Initiative 2.0. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Guilherme. Thank you, Daniele. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be with you in this enthusiastic group to show a little bit of, about our work. Uh, Guilherme is loading uh, our presentation. Yeah. And uh, I will talk then about uh, our laboratory in Rio Claro. It belongs, it's one laboratory for the, from the Institute of research in bioenergy. There are many institutes uh, scattered through Sao Paulo in many campuses of uh, UNESP. Yeah? It's a special institute of UNESP. And we are located in the central laboratory in Rio Claro. And uh, we have uh, a laboratory dedicated especially to do evolution experiments with yeasts. Okay? Then, I would like then to present a little bit of, of my laboratory. So here is where we are located in New Claro, yeah, at the IPBEN Institute for Research in Bioenergy. And this is our laboratory then. We enjoy to work with EAST. And these are our enthusiastic group me and Professor Ana Paula Jacobus, yeah, we lead this group of students, and we are dedicated mainly then to do experiments with uh, yeast evolution experiments. A field known as adaptive laboratory evolution, very well known for, from the Richard Lenz experiment of over 30 years evolving E. coli in the lab, and we do something similar, okay? And we uh, have several focuses of research, tolerance to stresses, and also uh, evolution experiments 
uh, applied to uh, the development of uh, high value compounds by attack tools we develop a lot too. It stresses, for example, ethanol stress in the first generation. Ethanol and also uh, in the second generation, the lignin cellulose hydrolysates inhibitors, for example. High value compounds, we have projects in lactic acid biosynthesis, in xylose assimilation, and also we work a little bit with E. coli. Uh, with sucrose uptake and also polyhydroxyalkanoates synthesis. And also we develop tools, a special one I will talk a, a little bit about is our CRISPR tool we are establishing in our lab. Yeah. Then our approaches, everything turns around adaptive laboratory evolution. Uh, we do genomics in support of that. We do phenotyping of yeast, evolved yeasts, and also we do a lot of genetic engineering of the mutations we found, and for that also we have a, a special biotech tools, DNA recombinant tools that we establish in the lab. I will talk then uh, everything uh, to generate superior yeast strains for uh, biotechnological purposes, okay? And I will talk about adaptive laboratory evolution, the main focus of our laboratory, yeah. And what is adaptive laboratory evolution? Is uh, the perform of evolution experiments in, let's say, in a Darwinian way when you uh, put uh, yeast cells in propagation under a specific pressure, stress or nutritional pressure, and over time, then the cells will acquire mutations and will evolve uh, and the uh, superior uh, phenot genotypes will start to take control of the population and express then a superior phenotype, resistant tolerance to the stress supply. There are many ways to do simple, simple ways, serial transfers. Also, one can alternate transfer under the stress or uh, do uh, harsh treatments and recoveries or work with chemostasis nowadays, people do in a full robot platform, yeah, with many parallel populations. After we sequence the genome and we discover the variants that appear during the evolution. And then we analyze these variants and engineer is for having then the tolerance phenotypes, okay? And one example of an experiment that we are conducting in our lab, we already did the workflow of evolution, yeah, is shocks to ethanol. Simply treatments of two hours, 32 degrees for two hours at a given concentration starting with 19% and then recovering in a fresh medium to grow for two to four days until the stationary phase and then repeat the treatment many, many times and repeat many cycles, increasing the ethanol concentration. So it's what we did with four different replicates, we call population. This, for example, is the population one. We will start with 19% and after more than 60, almost 70 treatments and recoveries of high ethanol content, up to 30%, yeah, we see then the uh, adaptation over time of these the strains. Then, that's the cool thing, it uh, was almost one year of this treatment. Then afterwards, we, we want to see what happened at the end, and for that, we need to know also the initial state, yeah, and then, here is when the genomic supports come. And we are doing, a, we have been quite active in that uh, field. Um, we recent uh, uh, analyzed the genome sequence at a high resolution of the main bioethanol strain here in the production of 1G ethanol, which is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae pedra 2, and analyze it this genome against many, many others available genomes, 
in a comparative genomic analysis. So now we, we understand quite well what is the nature of the ancestor genome in our experience. And having then the ancestor genome, we can sequence then the evolved genome and elucidate then the mutations that appear. And here you can see, for example, a landscape of mutations we found during this experiment. Yeah. And also we resolve it not only in the final part, but in the intermediate steps of the evolution experiment. So you have a, a very nice collection of mutations that we can analyze, we can then reverse engineering the parental strain, we can understand the interaction of the mutations too, and do a full uh, study of adaptation to ethanol treatments. And for that then, here comes then the genetic engineering part. Yeah, and when we select then the most important alleles and start to reverse engineer them into the uh, parental strain, the progenitor of the experiment. We are using a lot of our CRISPR tool we developed in our lab. And after that, we can analyze and scrutinize them individually for survival rates, fermentation performance, but especially we concentrate a lot in this kind of phenotyping, which, which is competition experience. When we compete uh, head to head, the reverse engineering strain and the parental strain to see then uh, the adaptation of the reverse engineering strain uh, in the environment of ethanol treatments used for the evolution experiment. Then for the support of all our uh, molecular genetics and synthetic biology, then we apply a lot of interest in creating biotech tools, in establishing biotech tools in our lab, especially talking about DNA recombinant tools and mutagenesis tools. For example, uh, we established several methods of multi-part uh, DNA recombinant assembly, which we use, for example, transformation in E. coli in Saccharomyces cerevisiae with in vivo assembly of the fragments. This is very interesting. Uh, very few people know that E. coli can clone very well at least one fragment or even more than one fragment without any uh, DNA ligase or any prior reaction. Yeah? And we published a paper describing this method, how easy it is to clone a fragment in E. coli without any kit. We also use this method, interesting method, is a kind of fusion PCR approach to molecular cloning. Yeah, and with that, for example, we establish a plasmid for the road of assimilation of psi loss. From, uh, we took the genes from picky stipids, the psi loss, reductase, uh, and the uh, xylitol dehydrogenase, and also xylulose kinase, Everything in one plasma, to, we combine it then in one plasma and transform it in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, establish it. This was the plasma reconstructed from 14 pieces using these methods, okay? Uh, we also use Gibson and Golden Gate as assembly, are also very useful to use, but we tend to uh, favor the use of, of, of techniques that don't use commercial kits for cloning. And everything we do for plasmid engineering, uh, assembling constructs for integration to the known pathway engineering, and also we use a lot to establish our plasmids for the CRISPR method you use in our lab. This is what I would like to talk about a lot because we are very excited about these results. Yeah. Uh, is what we call easy guide because uh, it's a method 
to generate gRNA, guiding RNAs in a very easy way based on PCR and in vivo cloning in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We start with two plasmids. One of them is this p easy g It specifies one gRNA and one promoter uh, RNA is polymerase 3 promoter, which drives then the expression of the guiding RNA. And we specify, for example, the resistance of hygromycin. This is an E. coli propagating plasmid, okay? But the pieces are for expression in Saccharomyces cerevis. And basically, in one simple PCR, where you add then uh, the 20 nucleotide targets that you want to make the mutagenesis in the genome, only 22 as a tail for your primer, you can amplify then a PCR and you have a fragment. And the other fragment, complementary fragment, comes from another plasmid, a second one, and this one specified then the origin of replication in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It also carries a gRNA, encodes a gRNA and a promoter for the expression of the gRNA. And then we do a second PCR, and this time the primers, the four primer is the second target, and the reverse primer is the uh, first target and you generate a second fragment. And what is really cool is that both are not functional in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. However, they recombine within the Saccharomyces cerevisiae to make a functional plasmid by in vivo recombination. And then you have a functional plasmid expressing two gRNAs, okay? This is how, more or less, you do then the transformation with the two PCR fragments and also with the donors, a simple PCR reaction. So you have, for two targets, four reactions, PCR reactions. For one target, it would be three PCR reactions. We could transform everything, and then you have the recombination within the cell expression two functional gRNAs, and we work with a strain already transformed with a plasmid expressing the Cas9. And the combination of everything then gives us the mutagenesis. And with the donors then we repair the double straight break caused by Cas9, and we will introduce the desired mutation. This is a very simple method, a yeah, very efficient one method, and we see several advantages to work with that. The first one is cloning kits, those are not necessary. Even the pre-cloning of gRNA in E. coli, for example, which is common in this kind of approach, is completely unnecessary. Then you have a very fast workflow of one day where we do three PCRs for one target, three PCRs for two targets, four PCRs. Yeah. And then we analyze the same day, for example, the same morning you do the PCR, you analyze in gel electrophoresis, and then PCR purification before transformation. Also not necessary, also dispensable. And any treatment to eliminate the template plasmid is also not necessary. Then it's very simple. We you take from the PCR reaction and transform in Saccharomyces cerevisiae in the same day and you get then the mutagenesis with high efficiency. Usually 100% of the three fragments, three mutations we have been getting uh, 100 percent efficiency with this approach is really cheap and fast and efficient okay and with that in hand we, we can do a lot of uh, genetic engineering uh, 
We are free for, for metabolic engineering approaches and synthetic biology, uh, which we uh, aim to combine with our adaptive laboratory evolution approaches, combine the two approaches to generate then superior strain. One example in our lab is the synthesis of lactic acid, a kind of bioplastic replacement for the oil basic plastics. Yeah. Then it's a very interesting molecule. And we do that with metabolic engineering approaches. And we do also with adaptive laboratory evolution approaches where we select mutations that are uh, confers high tolerance to the product of this biosynthesis, which is the lactic acid, which lowers the pH of the medium and then uh, imposes difficulties for the, the yeast cells to grow. Then if, if yeast cells have high tolerance to low pH, then the production is higher. Okay, and then we do did a lot of uh, metabolic engineering. We introduced three copies of the uh, lactic acid dehydrogenase from leuconostoc mesenteroides, uh, codon adapted for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, to establish the biosynthetic key biosynthetic pathway for production of lactic acid, and we are doing a lot of. Uh, metabolic engineering eliminating competing roads to uh, drive the metabolic flow towards the synthesis of lactic acid. At the same time, in parallel, we are doing evolution experiments then, several, at least three different protocols based on uh, acid lactic shock, shocks, working with two different strains, the bioethanol and one lab strain, and also continuous serial transfers also in the presence of lactic acid. And here is an example of the evolution experiment with harsh treatment of two hours of high content of lactic acid. Look how amazing the evolution progressed throughout almost one year from 2% to 15% concentration of lactic acid, the cells are tolerating. And then we aim at sequencing the genome of these strains and uh, starting to study and elucidate the basis of lactic acid tolerance with different AO approaches. Yeah? And then combine everything with the metabolic engineering approach, we then expect to have a high yields of at the classic production. At the same time, you have also tolerance to the low pH. Then this was a, a little bit a showcase of our approaches. We have many other projects, but the time now is impossible to talk about them. Then I thank you very much for your attention and open to questions if you want, yeah. Acknowledge those who did the work. Our amazing co-workers yeah, at the laboratory of genomics for East Genomics and Evolution Laboratory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jefferson. Uh, now for our next session, I'd like to invite my former professor, Ilhe Malavasi, from Uxcar, he's representing San Carlos. He's actually a character in the Dungeons and Dragons game that I play with my friends, but he doesn't know that. Okay, good morning to everyone. Thank you, the organizers, for this kind invitation. Thank you, Guilherme. Thank you, Anderson, for the encouraging words. And it's my pleasure to be here. And it was a big surprise and a nice surprise to see my colleagues talking about fungi, but now we are going to talk about real fungi. <laughs> because people say that 
filamento of fungi has different tissue, okay, and that's the carmel, but that's just a, gr a growth in the field. But I'm um, Ida Malavaz, I work in the Federal University of San, San Carlos. This is the only federal university in the countryside part of the Sao Paulo state. I've been funded from FAPESP during my entire career here since I established my lab. And the, our uh, favorite fungus is this human pathogen, Acrogelus fumigaris. So, just to remind you that fungi are nothing like plants. People in general, they made this mistake, but if you see this, the fungal tree of life here, you see that one million years ago we have a diversion, and plants are here and fungi are here, and so they are different. But this difference also brings some important information because if you think about fungal pathogen, this similarity with mammals causes some trouble in order to treat patients who eventually are infected with fungi. And we have differences. I, I, I take the opportunity of this slide just to, to remind that we have about estimated 5 million species of fung fungi and uh, about 30 hundred diseases caused by this fungi. And one of this is Acrogelus fumigatus. Just a reminder here, uh, just take a look of this organism here, which is a, a, a soil-free amoeba that I'll be talking about later on in this talk. Okay, why fungi care? Why do I should care for fungi, especially fungal pathogens? Because the fungi are very aggressive pathogens. It causes a lot of disease of different ranges in humans. And we have a different kind of fungi uh, in terms of, uh, in the community, we say that we are neglected because different organisms and the research and the community are not that big. And so we urgently need more antifungals, especially because some uh, are, uh, new emerging diseases, which are, for example, Candida auris, which is naturally uh, resistant to the majority of antifungals anti that we have. And as Elizabeth said, we have also the problem of co-resistance uh, of clinical isolates that came from the soil. And so, the majority of fungi that attacks human are Candida cryptococcus and Aspergillus, which is a filamentous fungi. So, what about filamentous fungi, Aspergillus fumigatus? Just a fun fact, the name of this genus is was named after an Italian priest found that the fruiting bodies of the fungus was similar to a spiritulum, which is this instrument here that the Catholic priest uses to disperse holy water to the, the, the community. And so this is the origin of the name of Aspergillus. Aspergillus fumigatus is ubiquitous fungus. It, it inhabits all the earth, every place. In the nature, it is very important for recycling carbon and nitrogen. It is far the most uh, prevalent aspergillus that causes more than 90% of the causes of aspergillosis and the life-threatening form of disease is the invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, which is caused by this fungus. It is very important because if you think that uh, this fungus is a saprophyte, it lives in compost pile, it recycles carbon and nitrogen, but it is also aggressive pathogen and when this fungus reaches a immunocompromised individual whose population is terribly increasing because of the, mainly because of the transplant medicine. We have, we can have rates of death up from 60 to 90%. And people die from this disease. My lab is interested in this fungus and since I established the lab, I have been interested in the cell integrity pathway, which is a signaling pathway that coordinates the synthesis and remodeling of the cell wall of the, of the fungus, but there are a lot of other determinants of virulence in this fungus, and today we're talking about some, the interplay between cell wall integrity and secondary metabolites. Why as Aspergillus fumigatus is so successful as pathogen, as an opportunistic pathogen? One of the things that this fungus does best is conidiate, is to generate conidia, and it's accepted that we inhale on a daily basis about 100 to 200 conidia of this fungus from the environment. <clears throat> and compared to what aspergillae, this fungus conidiates much more and is very air and water dispersive. The conidia so can reach the 
patient, and when it reaches the patient, it goes to the aerial hyphae. If you are immunocompetent, no problem, but if you are immunosuppressed, it will cause a disease in your lungs and eventually lead you to death. Another important thing is that the morphotype that are in the environment is different from the morphotype that appears in the human lung. So we have an interplay between these two forms of the morphotypes of this fungus. And today I'm talking about what I'm interested, which is this form here, the conidia. As I told you, I'm interested in the cell integrity pathway. Why? So in fungi are important because it is a, a target of drugs, one drug here, which takes more than uh, 20 years to be established in the market, but it is uh, underexploited in terms of potentiality for new drugs. And then my lab was studying this signaling pathway here, among many others that are present in this fungus. Here is the cell integrity pathway, and we are working with this pathway since then. And we are interested in these genes in the pathway, which is an apical kinase called PKC, a MAP signaling cascade comprised for these three genes here, and this transcription factor downstream, which coordinates the expression of several cell target genes. What we saw when we were working with this pathway, I realized that when I deleted this transcription factor from this fungus, I realized this very interesting phenotype, which is only visible for people in the field, probably, because if you realize here, we see what we call fluffy phenotype, which is a phenotype that indicates that the fungus cannot conidiate as well as the wild type strain. It means that it can generate less conidia. And it is a hallmark. Since conidiation is a hallmark in this fungus, I started to try to understand why it was happening. I have a lot of data, and this talk is based on about two, um, on two papers that were recently published. And we understood now that this phenotype is partially controlled by the cell integrity pathway. We quantified this, and you can see here by the difference in the color of the conidia, this greenish color, that these mutants really conidiate less. But I wondered, since there is a close correlation, a close relationship between the fungus in the environment and in the human lungs, would this conidia of this fungus be different in terms of secondary metabolites? Because when the individuals inhale the conidia, it inhales all the chemical uh, richness of this conidia, which decorates the conidia, and also in the soil. Because if you think that life in the soil for this organism is not an easy life, because it has to compete with different organisms, it has to survive. And in the soil, we have many predators, such as amoebas. And in the lungs, we also have predators, which are the macrophages, the first line of defense of our immune uh, response. So we took a chemical approach and we extracted the chemical diversity of this conidia harboring this phenotype, and we found an uh, interesting secondary metabolite, which is not sold by any company, uh, which is phenethinazolin C, which was already described in Aspergillus, and we wanted to understand more about the secondary metabolite. What we saw is that, indeed, the cell integrity pathway controls the expression of this secondary metabolite, especially the transcription factor and the MAP kinase of the pathway. This is the molecule, and we wanted to investigate a little bit more. It was already described, the, signal, the, path, the chemical pathway that shows us how this secondary metabolite is produced. It is a chain of reactions that ultimately produces fumic nasoline C, which is the main fumic nasoline in the conidia of Aspergillus fumigatus. It, uh, this metabolite, uh, is produced after several enzymes, as it belongs to a class of very well-known secondary metabolites in fungi, which is called R NRPS, which is non-ribosomal peptide synthase. But what does this secondary metabolite do in the cell? We quantified this, and by many other methods that I'm not going to talk to you today, 
He, indeed, realized that the Theol integrity pathway was also controlling the expression, the production of the secondary metabolite. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, this screen is intimidating to me, you know. <laughs> And we saw that the cell integrity pathway controls the expression, we quantified the systemic mesolin production, and we saw that the genes are involved in the control, but we didn't see anything, we didn't know at this time the whole of this molecule. How and why this molecule is produced? We took a genetic screen, just my colleagues just mentioned in their talks, and we screened a bunch of mutants in Aspergillus syndicatus from my lab or from colleagues, and we found another transcription factor, which is called SAD8. And when we deleted this transcription factor, the fungus, the fungus increased the production of phenylmethazoline C by four times. Then we found an overproduced strain of the secondary metabolite whose, whose function is unknown. We quantified, we saw that this transcription factor is important for the, the transcription of the cluster of the synthesis of the phenylmethazoline C. This uh, transcription factor had already been characterized and it was in the literature as a general stress responsive transcription factor. Based on that, we isolated it after we knew something more, we isolated pure fumicinazolin C, growing about 150 petri dishes to isolate, using this mutant to get more compounds. And we wanted to study the function of this molecule. And then I used, the, as I mentioned to you, that in the soil, the life of this organism is not easy because of the predators. And it is thought in the community that coexistence of the fungi in the soil of this conidia, uh, counteracting against predators, there is a, uh, uh, a concept of accidental virulence. In other words, the fungi could learn in the soil from amoebas how to survive in the body, in the lungs from the macrophages, because amoebas and macrophages are very similar in terms of function. So, I used dictyostelium dysphagium to test the hypothesis which a free living amoeba. And we use one of the parts of the cell, of the cycle of this free living amoeba to test if this compound could be uh, important for the interaction between this, this uh, model, this, these two organisms. What we found was that when we incubated to make a long story short, what we found is that when we incubated fumic, pure fumic nasolin C with, uh, from, uh, sorry, when we incubated the mutants that produces more fumic nasolin C and mutants that produces less fumic nasolin C, the uh, ratio of phagocytosis by the amoeba was increased or decreased, depending on the amount of fumic nasolin C in the conidia surface. When the cell saw a lot of fumic, when the amoeba saw a lot of fumic nasolin C in the surface of the conidia, it didn't like the taste. You see here, there is much less phagocytosis by the amoeba. In contrast, when amoeba saw a conidia with less fumic nasolin C, the phagocytosis rate was enhanced. We quantified that by this graph here, and in this graph here, I'm just showing you that, showing you that the fumic nasolin C is not, uh, cannot kill the dictyostelium, but it has the effect on the phagocytosis. So it's not cytotoxic to the amoeba, but it causes this defect in phagocytosis. And, um, this is the only experiment I'm showing to you uh, that shows that the same pattern of recognition occurs in bony matter derived macrophage. So it, the same thing occurs with amoeba and macrophages. So we went again to the, to the production pathway, biochemical cascade, and what we did here was to delete the first gene in, in the pathway, in the cluster, to uh, abrogate the production of the whole 
number of filmed mesolin molecules in the fungus. So we deleted this first gene. And when I used this mutant, which does not produce filmic mesolin C, the rate of phagocytosis was increased, indicating again that filmic mesolin C is a molecule that matters for um, phagocytosis. Then, what I did was use pure filmic mesolin C and exogenously add to the media where I co-cultivated fungi and amoeba. And when I added filmic mesolin C exogenously, the fungi, the conidia that were, were uh, phagocytized, there was a difference, even those that uh, the the mutants that uh, uh, were, were more phagocytized were not anymore when I added more filmic mesolin to the media. You may wonder if this uh, fact is true. You may argue that filmic mesolin was killing the, the, the amoeba because there was a, a large amount of exogenously added Mesolin to the media, but in fact, up to this concentration of 100, 100 micrograms per ml, the dictyosterium was okay, it survived. So, to conclude, we saw that the cell wall integrity pathway controls the production of filmic mesolin C, is a positive produ uh, regulator. In contrast, this transcription factor, SEVA, is a negative regulator. Uh, due to its localization, we think that filmic mesolin C may be an antiphagocyte, uh, antiphagocytic molecule uh, in two models, the amoeba and uh, the macrophage. Uh, we didn't find, I didn't show you here, but we didn't find filmic mesolin C in the lungs of infected mice, indicating again, suggesting, stressing again the importance of the secondary metabolites in the soil in the competition, and uh, although filmic mesolin C does not kill the amoeba, it creates pores in the surface of the macrophage and the amoeba, and this is another data that I didn't show you today. So our hypothesis is that under stress, which is enhanced when I delete that stress-responsive transcription factor, I have overproduction overproduce of this molecule as a consequence to uh, allow the, the fungal cell to survive, especially in the environment very much. So just to thank my nice collaborators and the funding agents of this uh, over the time in my, in my lab. Thank you. And to conclude our tour around the region, I'd like to invite Professor Daniele from UNESP Araraquara. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, IGMAs. I'm really, really happy to be here to see you face to face, to talk to real people, not to my screen. It's really, really exciting. And especially this year, so I'm really excited that we have an IGM meetup here in Brazil, that we have an IGM meetup in South America with so many incredible teams participating, so many really great uh, uh, works you have done this year. I'm looking forward to see and to talk to you about all your projects. So. The train has finally arrived to Araraquara, the main station, and uh, I'm going to talk uh, to you about uh, my group, my Symbio uh, lab at UNESP. So, uh, give you uh, a little taste about what we have done, what we are doing uh, in our group. You already saw this map earlier. So 
a São Paulo, the São Paulo State University, UNESP, where I come from, uh, is a multi-campus uh, university. We have 24 campuses all around the São Paulo State. And we are here at Araquara, not too far from São Carlos. So the next time you come to São Carlos, I, I, I will guess most of you came from Sao Paulo or from Campinas. Next time, don't stop in Sao Carlos. Keep driving, all right? 30 to 40 minutes driving, you're gonna reach Araraquara. Odd thing about this map is Sao Carlos is oddly close to Colombia and Argentina. They even seem to belong to Sao Carlos. Uh, I was really uh, 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 confused to see that. But anyway, don't look for it. Go straight ahead and reach Araraquara. If you do that, you're gonna find our beautiful and green campus there, the UNESP campus Araraquara. We even have a, a lake there, or a pool, I'm not sure, but go there. So if you do that, you're gonna find our Department of Bioprocess Engineering and Biotechnology. And there you can find my lab and some other labs that are doing great jobs, amazing projects. We are open to receive you. Now, of course, we are starting to open our doors and we hope to be able to be fully open uh, very soon. So, Please come to visit us uh, if you can. I'm gonna talk a little bit so about our project there. What we do there is uh, to engineer strains and we love to engineer uh, regulatory processes. So we love to engineer new tools for synthetic biology and metabolic engineering. We love to build to engineer regulatory networks with regulatory proteins, regulatory RNAs, and everything we can uh, uh, fit together to, uh, uh, to display complex behavior uh, in microbial strains, mostly bacteria, but also uh, yeasts, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So uh, one project we just finished uh, was the construction of uh, a modular auto-induction system, auto-induction device for control of gene expression in Bacillus subtilis. That's an industrial uh, uh, important strain for the production of uh, uh, a lot of different compounds. And we used it to uh, use it the, the well-known LUXR, LUXI proteins to, to build a strain that can self-monitor and start the production of a compound at the right time. So we can induce and repress genes with this uh, system and do it with multiple genes as well and do it in a modular way. We tested with different genes, different gene clusters, and it always works the same and always do what we expect it to do. So one of our recent projects. Another recent project uh, we just finished is the targeting of ribosuits with synthetic small RNAs for metabolic engineering. So uh, bacteria, especially bacteria, uh, fungi use it too, but bacteria use it, use it the most. Uh, in bacteria, there are uh, structures, RNA structures called ribosuites, and they control gene expression of uh, uh, important metabolisms in the cell. So a lot of compounds in the main metabolism are controlled, their production are controlled by this RNA structure. When the metabolite binds to the ribosuite, it turns off gene expression. But if I want to produce a lot of one, uh, 
compound, I don't want to it to turn off in expression. So that comes our, uh, our wearable switch targeting, RNA. It binds, it pairs with the wearable switch and force it to turn on gene expression. So we can activate gene expression uh, up to 100 times. So uh, that's a really nice tool we use it to build uh, uh, an industrial strain. We actually took an industri industrial strain, strain producing vitamin B2, used these two to target some rival sweets, and we were able to increase the production up to 60% uh, using this industrial strain. And the most amazing thing, oops, the most amazing thing uh, that we don't understand yet completely is that we were able, even able to increase the growth of the strain. It uh, uh, implies no uh, uh, bound, no, no burden to the, the to the strain. Uh, it actually increases the growth of the strain. We we we, uh, uh, we hypothesize that because we are uh, uh, working with uh, important metabolized the purine metabolism in the cell. So we are somehow providing uh, some important uh, 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 compounds that the cell was not producing enough before. So we were able to increase the production and increase the growth of an industrial strain. Another thing we love to do is to play with regulatory proteins and RNAs RNAs to build regulatory networks. So here is one example uh, that we we built to uh, uh, a regulatory network to monitor micro RNAs. So the regulatory network compute uh, it combinates different inputs to generate one response. Uh, we do the same using uh, two hot switches. We also uh, develop two hot switches in our lab and use them to detect RNA. And that's a very useful tool, uh, this kind of 